Great to be back with Crex Investors. Merlin, thank you for having me. My name is Hugh Agra. I'm the president and CEO of Revival Gold. Revival is advancing the Bear Track Barnett Gold Project located in the western U.S. state of Idaho. Uh, we've been growing this project from now, nil to now 3 million ounces of gold. And we've recently put out some uh, very exciting high-grade results in our Joss area. Happy to tell you all about that. Hugh, nice to meet you. Thank you for joining us. Um, could you, before we kind of get into the, the, the detail of this, of your latest news release, could you just give us kind of an orientation, please, of um, the Bear Track Arnett project? Because it's, it, there are quite a lot of moving parts to it. So if you could just kind of give a, perhaps bring up a slide, um, just kind of to show us, uh, so we can get ourselves uh, orientated, we know where we are. Okay, super. I have got here a overview of the land position. Uh, this is an overview on a mag, uh, aeromag uh, uh, image of the property. It's about uh, 5,800 hectares. It's 100% hope controlled by Revival Gold. The right side of the property is known as the Bear Track side of the property. And the left side of the property is our net, hence Bear Track, our net. We consolidated this land position about four years ago through a number of transactions, dating back actually to the first governor of the state of Idaho, his descendants. Uh, so lots of history here. About um, a million ounces of gold have been mined uh, from Placer and from hard rock mining in this area in the, in the drainage systems here. We've got one major trend, which is the, bear, the Panther Creek shear zone here. And you can see the outline of the footprint of the existing resource of 3 million ounces along that trend and also at the satellite deposit here at AD. So those are the major features. Uh, we've got mineralization over five kilometers of trend down to 600 meters of depth. Uh, we've got quite high grades in this system, including 71 grams over 10 meters in the Wards Gulch area. More recently, we've been focused Merlin in the Joss area and I'm sure we'll come back to this, but here we've got a kilometer strike uh, with uh, very uh, high grades in the system for the underground phase uh, of this project. Uh, beyond that, uh, some of your viewers will know that this has got a heap leach phase to the project, uh, some of that material coming from Bear Track and the balance from Haiti, which is a satellite deposit here sitting above the mag high about five miles uh, tall to the uh, infrastructure, which we have in the apex of the property. And then a number of other prospects and uh, possibilities, which we haven't even drilled yet, uh, that uh, will, we'll, uh, I'm sure, turn into supplemental feed to that plan. So quite a lot going on here, as you've pointed out, uh, but that's the overall property position. Thank you very much. Just, 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 just so I get my kind of head around it, um, What's the, his, the historic activity at Bear Track? Has that all been in the open pit or was there underground uh, activity as well? Well, if we go back to the um, uh, late uh, 1800s, early 1900s, there's a couple of uh, underground mines that were in this location. Uh, nothing in a modern sense. The modern mine, the first modern mining operation got underway in the 90s uh, by a company called Meridian Gold, largest past producing gold mine in the state of Idaho. Uh, and uh, operated up until about 2000. Uh, the benefit of all of that activity is we know a lot about the geology and we know a lot, and we have a lot of uh, infrastructure that's been, uh, that remains, which we can redeploy. Uh, so yes, there has been quite a bit of mining activity in this area, uh, more recently open pit mining for heap leach gold production. And that of course is gonna be our, our first phase of the new operation. And have you, you, you said you've got lots of data. I mean, I've, I've had a look through your VP Explorations presentation on, uh, on the website. I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary data set you've got there. You've just got so much information. And I, I really like the way that he's approached it in terms of uh, mineral systems, just the, 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 uh, the overlaying of all that, of all that data. That, that's, you know, it's, it's great. Um, I also saw that you've got so much data that you're able to use some artificial, artificial intelligence. Of course, that only works when you're in a data-rich environment. Um, before we get into that, um, can you just tell me, um, what was the grade of the old heap leach operations through, through the 90s? And when did it, when did it um, stop production? Was it in that kind of low around 2000 when the gold prices were consistently below $300 an ounce? 
Yeah, first thing, I just want to comment. Uh, you're referring to uh, Steve Priestmeyer of EP Explorations presentation, which was given at the AEMA conference last week, available on our website for those that are interested. Mira Geos Geosciences did the three-dimensional and, uh, and the AI uh, work with our data set, uh, did an excellent job there. Um, but uh, coming back to your, your, your other questions, uh, yes, the operation shut in uh, 2000 when the price of gold was below about 250 an ounce. Uh, but it really wasn't the gold price that sent Meridian, the uh, prior operator, uh, to mothball this project. It was the fact that at the time there was uh, so much a greener pasture in Chile where they, where they went to discover uh, El Peñon. Uh, of course, back then, labor rates were quite a bit lower in Chile. Uh, today, they are higher. Uh, same with power. The power costs in Chile today are about three times what we enjoy in Idaho. And uh, finally, there's the permitting uh, regime, which back in those days in the early 2000s, you know, there was a lot, uh, it, folks could move a lot faster with permitting in South America because of the less guidelines. Of course, uh, in the United States, uh, we have guidelines. Uh, we have uh, very rigorous guidelines around permitting projects. And um, today, the rest of the world's caught up with that. So, uh, for all of those reasons, I think it makes sense to come back to Bear Track Arnett. And then, as you've pointed out, we've got a gold price, which is now almost uh, four times the level it was when this was last in production. Average grade at that time was about one gram per ton gold uh, fire assay, total, total gold content. And, um, and uh, our restart plan is uh, about 0.9 grams per ton uh, gold. Yeah. Um, and I see on the photograph that you've got a, that, you know, there's a nice big pit there. Um, and I can also see from your latest drill results that you've hit whatever it is, 111 meters at, um, uh, what was the, what was the grade of that? Um, the, 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 the two higher grade intersections were within a, a much broader um, mineralized package. Did the, was the old pit on a wide structure or were they, um, did they get pulled down on a narrow high grade structure or were they targeting kind of um, the diluted, um, more diffuse uh, um, kind of material? Let me show you another slide here. Uh, this is a long section through the main bear track trend. Uh, so you can see here in our current resource, $1,400 pit shells for uh, the resumption of production from, uh, from bear track or net. And uh, it's a little bit difficult to see, Merlin, but the prior pits are actually in the current topo shown here. So there was oh, one, wow. in the north pit, one in the south pit. Um, okay. It's a, it's a little bit difficult to see. And, um, and, and, I, and so I, this isn't exactly the slide to show you past mining versus where we're going to go. But you can see what we're talking about in terms of the existing uh, resource. And, uh, and you can see some of our drill intercepts and the drill intercept that we just uh, recently announced is down uh, here. It's not even on this page. I can show it to you on another page uh, in a moment, but it was 110 meters of 4.3 grams. And then within that, in the shear zone, in the main shear zone, we have uh, uh, about uh, 12 grams over 14 meters and another nine grams uh, over 12 meters. It's, um, it's, got, it's got a lot of uh, potential to continue to expand at depth with those grades. And this is an orogenic gold system. So as you know, these systems tend to go quite deep and they are quite large. Uh, Natalka would be an example of an orogenic gold system. Uh, Malarctic would be an example. Closer to Europe, the Kittala operation in Finland that Agnico operates is very similar to what we have here. So a couple of uh, pits and then underground potential. And we haven't, uh, uh, as you can see on this slide, we, the deposits open in all directions. Thank you, goodness. Um, so many, so many questions. Um, on one of your earlier slides, you, sorry, in, in, your, in your corporate presentation, you talk about it being a pressure oxidation deposit you put it in the category of pressure oxidation and yet you're going through um a heat bleach operation and in the historic heat bleach they also got good um uh, recoveries you're talking about 63 percent they it's believed got 70 percent um how can, can you and, and uh, when i look at your 
your your mineral assemblage you know that in that last slide of your corporate presentation or this or the pretty much the last slide shows the uh, a photograph of the drill core with the quartz arsenide pyrite pyrite veinlets in the shear zone in the panther creek shear zone um <clears throat> Is the refractory element of it linked to the arsina pyrite, and is it really a pressure oxidation route that you're going to get that you're going to have to go through if you go through a kind of a, a sulfide flotation treatment? Uh, well, let me let me show you that, um, that that image of the core. This is the uh, this is the core in the main shear zone, uh, and you can see. Um, it's, uh, it's very brecciated. Uh, it's been worked over. Uh, we think there's been at least uh, two or three mineralizing events in the main shear zone. Uh, this photo depicts about 19 grams over 5.3 meters uh, of core um, within that uh, 110 meters of 4.3 grams uh, gold. Uh, so you can see, you can have a good look at the rock here. And generally, yes, the uh, gold is associated with our scene of pyrite. Uh, and and uh, for that reason, we cannot liberate the gold, the fine gold with leaching uh, or with cyanide um, uh, directly. What we will have to do for the mill material or the sulfide material is oxidize it first. And we do that through a process we've developed with uh, wood PLC, uh, RPA, and uh, with our, uh, our, our, um, our metallurgical uh, test uh, team at SGS. Uh, it involves, uh, in the first instance, 20,000 tons a day through a mill, uh, producing about 3,000 tons a day of concentrate. And then that concentrate is uh, pressure oxidated to, to oxidize the material. And then we leach the residue and leach the tails to get 94% recovery. Uh, we've gone through two phases of MET test work to, uh, to, to develop up from very first principles a flow sheet and a cutoff grade of about 0.6 grams per ton gold in our current resource. Now we are obviously working over the last couple of uh, years. We've done two seasons of drilling. Uh, we've done a lot of optimization work. We're looking at um, potentially bringing down the scale of the mill, optimizing our recoveries, optimizing our man plans around uh, what a mill phase might look like. But we've got a whole heck of a lot more drilling to do. This deposit's open in all directions. And as this most recent uh, drill result shows us from Joss, uh, we've just We've just got uh, a ton of potential to continue to expand. And at higher grades, of course, uh, we will get uh, similar throughputs with a smaller mill size, lowering capital, bumping up the economics. Generally speaking, big, big picture, what we're talking about is a first phase heat leach operation to take advantage of those oxide uh, and transition materials that uh, remain at Bear Track RNET, uh, and then phasing into a mill which would produce something north of 200,000 ounces a year for something like uh, uh, 15 to 20 years uh, based on our internal conceptual plans at this point in time. Is, is there an argument for wanting to get a better understanding of the kind of mineral endowment of this region? I, I, I know this is a money question and perhaps this is an unfair kind of hypothetical kind of just throw it out there idea, but you know, you've got, these new targets, these new exploration areas that you've you've generated, you've got some really good indications from your current drilling. You've got um, that that long section you showed with all those um, areas open at depth. You might, um, I've, in the in the technical presentation, the geological presentation, you talk um, your VP exploration talks about two trends of mineralization. You've got the low angle one, and you've got the kind of the steeper angle one. And so it looks as if you've really got a handle on the. The, you've got a really good idea of the vectors of mineralization for you to target that kind of resource growth. Resource growth. Is there, in some part of you, or is it kind of a board discussion, you know, weighing up the arguments of, of perhaps just going slower on the heat leach, which might be um, take up time and energy, and actually let's aim for the big prize. You look at what's happening in Australia, um, you know, where they're drilling beneath, beneath these old pits and they're just seeing these deep things going down 600, 700 meters down to a thousand meters. And they're putting up these multi-million ounce resources and they're driving valuations of hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe a billion dollars of valuation. Sorry, you're laughing. Have I touched a nerve? No, you're, you're, bang, you're absolutely bang on. And it's interesting you bring up the Australians because, you know, we've, we've modeled this business so that we are not beholden to the... Uh, you know, a, a, 
a bullish market that's uh, throwing money at expiration. Uh, if we were in that market, we'd certainly have drilled a heck of a lot more because uh, we do have a lot of targets and they're permitted for drilling. And they are so obvious uh, in terms of what they can do in, in expansion. Um, and I'll show you just a couple of quick um, slides here that I think you're, you're, refer you're referring to. Um, the first one is the summary results from the AI that is uh, artificial intelligence work we did on targeting for uh, places to drill at Bear Track RNET. And um, this predates uh, some of the results we've got in JOST, but the main mineralized trend, uh, this is a three-dimensional view. I'm sorry, it's quite busy for the non-geologists, but the main mineralized trend is here. This is where we've got the bulk of the resource. And the red is indicative of areas of high priority for exploration. And we haven't even touched uh, these, these targets beyond Haiti on the, on the Arnett side of the property, let alone pursue the follow-up at Roman's Trench the confluence of structures that come together uh, here down in the, uh, in the rabbit area. But um, we certainly have a lot of drill targets and there's uh, lots of opportunity to, to continue to expand on what we have. I, I just wanna show you one, one more um, image, which I think uh, illustrates that potential and the reason why uh, we're so excited about the exploration potential and it's, um, it's a, it's, a, it's a view here of the drill results that we have uh, from the South Pit area at Bear Track running uh, all the way to the jaw. So we're talking about a, a, a kilometer and a half or 1.7 kilometers um, across the top of the deposit here. And these are drill holes that we have with assay results shown. The uh, pink shading is five grams and above. And really what's so obvious in this slide is that we've got a lot of open targets. And these are all places that we can come back and drill and continue to expand, particularly between the North and South pit. Uh, and remember the prior uh, focus was on open pit mining here uh, at Bear Track Arnett. So we have a lot of drill data in this area. Uh, we've been adding to the drill data in the Joss area. We've now have 18 holes in this area. Those 18 holes average uh, about, um, and I'm just going to flip you one slide on uh, in long section here. Those 18 holes average 7.4 grams per ton gold with a drilled width of just under five meters in the core and about 40 meters in the, in the halo beyond that. So you're asking absolutely the right question. Uh, shouldn't we do a bit more drilling rather than rush this thing into production? And I guess it's a, it's a, we've got our cake and eat it too, because we've got, uh, in addition to this great asset, we've got a great team. And we, we've got the general manager who ran this operation back in the uh, 90s with us, uh, leading the charge for Revival Gold. We've just brought on a gentleman uh, who is uh, leading our engineering. And uh, between the two of them, Pete Blakely, our general manager, John Mayer, recently appointed VP development, uh, we are moving both aspects of this project forward. And um, I think by the time we get through the end of 2022, uh, we'll take a look at the markets and we'll decide whether it makes sense just to pull the trigger, put this back into production, get ourselves $50 million a year of free cash flow at current gold prices, uh, and then continue to explore, or uh, look at doing the bigger project in a, in a two-step uh, phase. I. I just want to come back to your comment about the Australians. The thing that the Australians have done so well is focus on making money and uh, do so without diluting their shareholders. We've got 71 million shares outstanding. Uh, this is a company that uh, treasures its, uh, its capital base. And we, we want to be very careful not to issue shares uh, ahead of the street, understanding our, our uh, results. But uh, as you point out, it's a balance. We've got a lot of exploration potential here. Yeah, you certainly do. And, Nick, you're a mining engineer. Um, you've got a very strong technical team around you. Um, I guess if you were all geologists, the answer would be completely simple. You'd just be going for the exploration um, side of things. But because you've got the ability internally to, to analyze the, the, the engineering aspects of things and, and handle that relationship with consultants when you need to bring in extras, that's, that's a key factor. Um, Mike, Okay, so so a question for you is, I've got no idea about this. What's the mining situation like in Idaho? Because do you have an understanding what is a, um, 
a minimum underground grade that actually makes money? Coming back to the Australian thing of making money. Yeah, we've done a um, well. First of all, yes, I'm a mining engineer, which unfortunately is a is a is a real is a real burden on our geologists because we're not asking our geologists to find ounces of gold. We're asking our geologists to find value, and there's a big difference in a lot of exploration companies. Uh, there's a lot of uh, kerfuffle and a lot of uh, enthusiasm over chasing gold results. We're chasing value. And it's, um, it, it's because we come from big companies. We come from companies that uh, you know, understand the value of all the other things that go into pr- producing gold from a mining operation. It's not just go- geology. It's a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a license to operate from the local community. It's, it's a permitting regime. It's economics. It's the right people. And so we're working on all of those aspects uh, to bring this project forward. And, um, and, and so the question you're asking me, well, what grade will make sense here? Uh, we think the grades that we have in the Joss area absolutely make sense for underground mining. Uh, there is a requirement to develop up a critical mass to this deposit, uh, no question about that. Uh, and, and the way we, uh, if, if I could do that uh, here, I'll, I'll, I'll show you quickly a, a slide uh, on, our, on our thinking about value creation. So if we think about NPV on the y-axis, that is net asset value or, or economic value, and ounces in the mine plan on the x-axis, we start out with a heat bleach plan currently uh, contemplated at about 72,000 ounces a year. Uh, producing uh, set, uh, producing uh, about $50 million a year of free cash flow. Uh, we will optimize and enhance that through exploration and, uh, and, and mine planning efforts. Uh, we've got uh, column tests underway to improve on our recoveries. We're looking at bringing our pit slopes up. All of that will add value to the project. Uh, but we're still only talking at you know, just over a million ounces of potential in that heat leach. The real um, exciting thing about this project is, is, the, is the sulfide uh, opportunity. We've got now 3 million ounces of gold. Uh, we think there's a whole heck of a lot more. I've talked a little bit about the targets at Joss, and, and we've talked about uh, Haiti, Roman's Trench. These are immediately obvious opportunities for us. Beyond, you know, we, we haven't even talked about the things beyond that uh, that have come to us through our AI uh, research. Uh, but... All of that takes us through an inflection point. So at some point here, uh, we're going to come out with uh, economics on the mill phase. We're not quite at the point there where we think we've uh, exhausted the immediate exploration potential to do that. And so your question, do we have underground grades that make sense? The answer is yes. We've tasked uh, Wood to do some analysis on that already internally for our, uh, for our resource uh, uh, to guide our exploration. Uh, but we have so much potential to continue to expand this deposit. I think it's a little premature for us uh, to start uh, putting the mill phase into an economic study. Heck, it's even been premature for us to have done that with the PEA phase on the, uh, on the heap leach. It only includes seven years of mine life. And we know that that's going to grow to eight, nine, 10 years. No question about that. The deposits are open at AD. And we've got a, a number of other targets uh, that will continue to add, supplement, build on that project. So this is an exploration story. You're absolutely right. <laughs> we need to spend, uh, <laughs> excuse me, more money on uh, on drilling. Uh, the geologists will uh, be happy to hear me saying that. Good. Now, on the j- just a couple of I, um, qu- questions on the heat leach. Is there a very sharp transition between the oxide and the and the sulfide, or is there a kind of a mixed zone that you have to? be very careful about incorporating onto the heat leach because of the recoveries? Uh, very good point. Uh, it is not, uh, there is not a, a clear distinction between oxide and sulfide. We do have a transition zone. Uh, and for that reason, every block in our resource model has both a cyanide soluble grade and a fire assay grade. So for the uninitiated, that allows us to determine the recovery of each block and to send each block in the resource model to the best process, whether that be heat leach or mill, based on its economic return. And in fact, uh, of the 30 million tons in our first phase heat leach plan, about 20 are oxide, 20 million tons, and the balance is transition and sulfide. Uh, And we take that that all into account when we look at the recoveries uh, and also with treating those materials in the leach pad. 
And, and uh, yeah, and that's going to be the next question, whether you do a kind of a, a, a saline or a salt or an acid drip or a, you know, agglomeration. What's the, what's the, the process there? The, the process is pretty much what was done in the past, a two-stage crush uh, to about two inches. We're looking currently at moving that down to about an inch and a half. It'll be the same equipment that does that, but we might be able to get better recovery. So we're looking at it now. 13 column tests under leach right now for that purpose. Um, but um, beyond that, and this, uh, this is an important aspect, uh, we have costed into this plan fully lined leach pads and fully lined uh, uh, waste rock facilities. And the reason we do that is because water in the United States, and especially in the Western United States, is the key permitting uh, challenge. And, uh, and so we wanted to make sure that our economics reflected uh, first class approach to leaching and to, um, and to uh, waste rock storage. Of course, we've got 30 years of history on this site managing water, so we know how to do it. And we have hydropower in Idaho, so this is a very carbon-friendly place to be, uh, to be mining. Uh, and it, it all sort of builds into our ESG uh, plans and approaches, uh, something we want to be uh, very mindful of in, uh, in, in, in uh, regardless of of the interest of investors just as a point of uh, being good neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, um, I'm not a huge fan of ESG per se. I'm a, I'm a greater fan of um, being a good operator. Um, but um, <clears throat> my question, my next question then is valuation. So you've got a market cap of around 30 million US. Um, you present an NPV five of 150 million. Uh, for the PEA, for the heat leach, um, and a capex of about 100 million. So my, I just, and an IRR of 38%. So my, my immediate feeling is that if you put in an NPV eight, you're probably around a hundred million dollar NPV. Um, so with a 30 million US market cap, you're trading at around 0.3 nav on the heat leach. Just that's my mental. Is that about right? Yeah, I think you're, 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 you're probably bang on. Uh, there's not a lot of credit right now in the market for, our uh, mill project upside. And uh, I think that's the opportunity for investors today. We've got about 40% institutional holding, uh, which is quite high for a company of our size. Um, and, um, and, and really the, our institutions don't trade a lot of stock. Uh, they're pretty, pretty uh, solid and have been very supportive along the way here. Uh, management owns 11% of the company. So you know where we're uh, fighting, we're fighting for a shareholder uh, value uh, as we progress the company, and um, I think it's just a great opportunity, uh, right, especially right now, and especially given the results we've been getting at Joss and the exploration potential. And I think you're onto something here, Merlin. We've been talking about the brownfield site, the ability to restart production from a modest point of view, and I think um, I think we now start. Uh, um, uh, shouting a little bit more from the treetops about the exploration potential. There's a ton of it. And, um, and that's what's attracting investor interest today. Uh, we just looked to look at Great Bear. Um, very similar kind of uh, overall picture here, you know, five kilometers of strike. Uh, they've got about twice the drilling in that project that we do, but it was a $1.8 billion Canadian takeover and just points to the value of these kinds of projects in good, jo in good locations, um, in good settings. Yeah, absolutely, and and um, I mean, I don't know what a, the, the capex is on a on a pressure oxidation plant, but you're way away from that. You've got you've got plenty of time to um, get get that data in and get some benchmark data in um, and socialize those ideas for the market. Keep going on the exploration and advance the 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 feasibility study, which I think is due for the end of next year. Isn't that right for the sorry the PFS? You're targeting PFS completion in 2022 for the heat beach. Correct. Great. Well, um, I think that's that's given me a much better understanding of the of what the, all the moving parts. I hope that's given anybody who watches this um, the a, a better understanding. Is there anything else that you feel I've, I've kind of really missed out uh, that we kind of key things you want to add? Or well, you 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 did ask about Idaho as a location, and I I, I should I I maybe I I didn't spend enough time on that, but I'll just you know a couple of things. First of all ranked top 10 in the world as a place to invest in exploration and mining by the Fraser Institute, ranked number one in the world in terms of policy 
Uh, it's got a lot of mining heritage that goes back uh, almost 150 years. In fact, it was founded, uh, the state was founded on mining and the governor just named December 6th uh, as, uh, as a day for mining. And so we're in the right state. Uh, we're in the right part of the state. This is a brownfield site. So it's, uh, we've got a lot of experience with uh, mining uh, safely and responsibly in this location. And we've got the support of the local uh, community for this, for this project and the, and the prosperity that comes with it. Now, there's a long way to go between now and when we're producing gold from a, from a mill phase of this operation. But uh, this is a great location to be. And um, we're feeling very confident about uh, being able to track the right people um, and, um, and do so in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that's responsible for the community. Great, uh, Hugh, thank you so much. Now, in the spirit of Columba, I've just got one final question. Um, cash um, and the budgets for next year, you know, how's that gonna work? What, what are your plans there? Yeah, so we ended the last quarter at about uh, $3 million. Uh, so we will be looking at doing a financing at some point uh, along the way here. Uh, we're in no great rush. Uh, the next major milestone for us, uh, having just put out uh, uh, drill results, appointed uh, uh, John Mayer as VP development uh, is um, in January, February, uh, March, we'll put the rest of our drill results out. Uh, we've got a resource update coming, which is an exciting resource update for us because it's got another two years of drilling into it. And so uh, Wood PLC is underway with that. Um, and, um, and we'll start uh, narrowing in our game plan for the drill program in 2022 around that March timeframe as well, uh, subject to the results from the, uh, uh, from the resource update. So no great rush to do any uh, financing at the moment, but uh, we'll certainly have that on our horizon for 22. Uh, we wanna complete the PFS on the heat bleach phase of the operation by the end of 22. And then the other thing that we're working on in the background is our supplemental baseline environmental data. Uh, we're already engaged with the regulators, so we'll develop up a plan of operations and by the end of 22, we'll be at a point where we can either pull the trigger on that uh, first phase heat bleach project uh, or decide to uh, do, as I think you were suggesting earlier, uh, which is to uh, expand out our, our work and our exploration for the larger leach plus mill phase. All that to come in 2022. Great. Well, I look forward to uh, keeping abreast of the updates. Thank you, Merlin. Thank you.